So what's been done so far? I mentioned we've done a lot of literature reviews. We've done sent surveys out to experts for their input. We've done a lot of secondary data analyses. And at this point, criteria for individual disorders have been proposed. Uh, measures have been proposed. Um, and these proposed criteria and measures have been posted on DSM5.org. I'm curious how many of you have been on the website. Just some of you. OK, good. That's great. Did any of you give us comments? Yes, some of you have? Good. We read them and uh, carefully thought about them. Uh, we're currently discussing the metastructure. And this is, uh, the metastructure is uh, very much a collaborative effort with the World Health Organization. And there's a goal of developing a common organization for DSM-5 and the ICD-11 uh, mental disorders chapter. And we're now planning for field trials to test our proposed changes and measures. And the field trials are getting underway right now. So in case you haven't seen the website, um, it includes a lot of uh, useful information, background information on the DSM revision process, uh, information on thinking about dimensions. Um, you will find proposed uh, revisions uh, to the DSM-4 criteria, rationale for proposed changes from DSM-4, proposed severity measures, and then the DSM-4 criteria are posted just for easy comparison. And there's a lot of good additional information there if you'd like to take a look at it. The website was open for public comment um, until mid-April. We got more than 8,600 comments. And the work groups carefully reviewed all the comments. And we made changes in response. Very helpful comments. We really appreciated getting them. Um, so I thought you might be interested. There is a, a total of 38.9 million hits. Um, and a total of eight, more than 8,000 comments. And it's interesting to look by work group to see. So we got the second largest number. I think maybe that's in part because we have so many disorders. But um, you know, a combination, it was nice, a combination of, peop uh, of peop a lot of uh, researchers, clinicians, and patients and advocacy groups commenting on what they liked about what we had proposed, and also making very thoughtful criticisms. And we, uh, you know, giving a rationale for why, um, you know, they suggested we do something different. And in, uh, in some cases, pointing out supporting evidence uh, for their perspective. And so that was really helpful. Apparently, I don't know, no one's not, no one's too interested in sleep. Although it is, I think it's kind of important. But um, they didn't get too many. Or maybe it just means they're, all their proposals are perfect. I'm not sure. The current status, I mentioned field trials are about to begin. We'll collect data on the proposed changes to diagnoses and measures. And some individual work groups are doing their own. We call them field surveys, so they don't get confused with the official field trials. But we're doing our own, our own uh, field surveys just to collect more data on some of our proposed changes. So we are, my work group's doing an internet survey on PTSD. Um, we've done some hoarding. Uh, surveys, and uh, it, we're trying to get as much evidence as we can to support our changes. The meta structure is, continues to be under active dis uh, discussion. We'll start writing the text soon. And as I mentioned, no final changes have been made yet. It is still a work in progress. I thought I'd say just a little bit about the field trials. Um, they've been designed to examine proposed diagnostic revisions, primarily reliability assess whether the proposed re uh, revisions are useful to clinicians. We're getting clinician input on how usable and, and feasible uh, these criteria changes are, the feasibility of implementing proposed changes, and how proposed changes impact treatment plan diagnosis and treatment planning. And the field trials will be done in very, among various patient groups with a whole broad range of diagnoses. Uh, we'll have various types of clinicians involved from various mental health disciplines across the age span. Some, some of the field trials will be done in children uh, to old age and in different uh, clinical settings, large hospital clinics, smaller practices, private practices. And then a second phase of field trials is planned for 2011 for any additional kind of outstanding issues that we just feel we need more data on. Uh, to indicate whether the changes do have reliability and clinical utility. Um, and in, in, in different settings, they'll be done in different settings. And then based on the field trials and the data from the field trials, we will then revise criteria, proposed diagnostic criteria again, as needed. 
And um, uh, so, and then, so we'll get the data from the phase one field trial, revise criteria again, and then do um, a second round of more limited field trials as needed uh, to test any further changes that we feel we need more data on. So there are many proposed changes for DSM-5. Do visit the website if you haven't. I can't review all of them. Uh, they're, they're quite extensive, but I thought I'd touch on some of them. And I've just picked some, I don't know, changes I feel might be of particular interest or I find uh, uh, interesting and, and important for patient care, for uh, research as well. So uh, I'll start with some proposed changes to the diagnostic criteria. Um, generalized anxiety disorder has been of great interest and um, is, uh, I think, of my work group's disorders is one of the ones that has relatively more proposed changes. Uh, the proposal is to, to delete some of the possibly. We have to see what the field trials show. Uh, whether this uh, makes sense, to delete some of the associated symptoms of GAD, uh, such as sleep disturbance and irritability, but to retain restlessness and muscle tension, and to add some behavioral symptoms, uh, such as reassurance seeking and procrastination. Uh, Gavin Andrews uh, from Sydney, Australia, is one, uh, one of our work group members. He's already tested, he's already done his own extensive field surveys testing these proposed changes uh, and uh, has a fair amount of support for them. And then uh, GAD will also be in, we're going to do two different kinds of field trials, and it will be in both of our field trials. One set of field trials will be done in large academic centers, another in, in uh, a whole network of clinical practices, and we'll test GAD in both. Separation anxiety disorder, it's currently in the childhood section, but we've, there's been data uh, indicating that um, this disorder uh, can have onset in adulthood can occur in adults, and so we're going to slightly modify the criteria to make them more applicable to adults. Uh, this is part of the development, trying to make the manual more developmentally sensitive. We tend to think of that as making it more applicable to children and adolescents, but this is a case of a disorder uh, being applicable to adults, and we propose to move this disorder to anxiety disorders. Depersonalization disorder, uh, there's been a proposal to uh, add derealization symptoms which uh, are not well captured by DSM-4. Social phobia and specific phobia. Social phobia, I should mention the name. There's some name changes uh, that have been proposed. Social phobia will, uh, has been proposed to be changed to social anxiety disorder, which I think is already in pretty wide use in the field. And uh, we propose to delete the requirement that the patient recognizes that their fear is excessive or unreasonable. So I think those of you who work with these clinicians um, hear from patients that, you know, they don't always realize that their fear is out of proportion to the reality of the situation. Um, and technically speaking, if a patient thinks their fear is realistic and warranted, they wouldn't get these diagnoses um, and probably should. So we are going to replace, we propose to replace this with phrasing that makes this the clinician's judgment. PTSD, there's been tremendous, tremendous amount of work and, uh, and an incredible effort on the part of work group members and advisors to work on PTSD, such an important disorder. And there are quite a number of proposed changes. I, I, I chose two of them to highlight here. One is that the DSM-4A1 criterion has been criticized for its definition of traumatic. And of course, there's no, no perfect way to define any of these disorders, but there has been a fair amount of, uh, of criticism of that. And so the new definition sort of tightens up the A1 criterion to try to better distinguish it from tr uh, traumatic in, uh, events uh, that are distressing but don't exceed the traumatic threshold. Um, and the new criteria focus primarily on death or threatened death, actual or threatened serious injury, or actual or threatened sexual violation. And there's more specification of these criteria. Um, and other criteria emphasize a broader variety of negative emotional states, anger, guilt, and shame, besides fear, helplessness, and horror. The DSM-4 definition is fairly anxiety and fear-based. I think there's been a lot of research showing there's a much broader range of emotions involved in PTSD, like shame, guilt, uh, depressive symptoms, um, and anger, and uh, irritability, 
and those we propose to add a, a broader range of emotion and affect. Body dysmorphic disorder. The proposal is to add a criterion for repetitive behaviors, compulsive repetitive behaviors like mirror checking, excessive grooming, skin picking, or reassurance seeking, or mental acts like comparing with others in response to the preoccupation with the uh, perceived appearance defects or flaws. This criteria set in DSM-4 is very skeletal. And we've gotten input from clinicians that it's too brief and too vague and they're not sure how to make the diagnosis. So we went back and did a lot of secondary data analyses trying to figure out, you know, do all patients do these behaviors uh, and, and can they be added to the diagnostic criteria? Our analyses suggest that at some point during the disorder, virtually all patients do these behaviors. And we think it's probably, first it's an important treatment target. You know, so especially if you're going to do cognitive behavioral therapy, and probably helps differentiate BDD from social anxiety disorder and from depression, with which it is frequently confused or misdiagnosed as. OCD, not many major changes for OCD, um, but we are proposing to delete the requirement that the patient recognizes that their OCD obsessions or compulsions are excessive or unreasonable. First, these are these are tough terms to define, and they mean a lot of different things. But the main reason to, for the proposal to delete this is there's been a fair amount of research on insight in OCD, finding that there's a broad range of insight and that some patients actually have delusional OCD beliefs. They are completely convinced that their belief is correct. For example, you know, if I don't check the stove 30 times, the house will burn down. It's probably f fewer than 5% is what have, studies have found. But um, there are, you know, some patients have delusional beliefs, and we feel it should be considered OCD as opposed to delusional disorder, which is how it's classified in DSM-4. The worry is that if it's a form of delusional disorder, patients um, potentially get inappropriate treatment, uh, sometimes you know, with antipsychotic monotherapy, for example. Uh, somatization disorder, undifferentiated somatoform disorder, pain disorder, hypochondriasis. The proposal from that work group is to combine these disorders into one overarching disorder with subtypes. Some proposed changes for specifiers and subtypes for OCD. One of the proposed changes is to add a tick-related specifier. Uh, the so the specifiers, as you probably know, follow the criteria set. And the purpose, I think, is to identify an additional clinical feature that we think is imp very important for clinicians to be aware of. So the patients would meet all of the diagnostic criteria, but the addition of the specifier ideally would be to help clinical, improve clinical care. So the thinking was that, you know, tick, uh, the presence of, of comorbid tick disorder in patients with OCD is important for clinicians to be aware of. Because these patients, OCD patients with comorbid ticks, differ in some ways from OCD patients with outcome morbid tics. Uh, a preponderance of males, more premonitory sensory urges, um, and perhaps most importantly, some treatment differences in that those OCD patients who have comorbid tics may respond better to augmentation of a serotonin reuptake inhibitor with a neuroleptic, with an antipsychotic medication. <laughs> 